Part Two of Maud, Prose and Verse by Christina Rossetti. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rather more than a year had elapsed since Maud parted from her cousins, and now she was expecting their arrival in London every minute. For Mrs. Clifton, unable to leave her young family, had gratefully availed herself of Mrs. Foster's offer to receive Agnes and Mary during the early winter months, that they might take music and dancing lessons with their cousin. At length the rumbling of an approaching cab was heard, then a loud knock and ring. Maud started up, but instead of running out to meet her guests, began poking vigorously at the fire, which soon sent a warm, cheerful light through the apartment, enabling her, when they entered, to discern that Agnes had a more womanly air than at their last meeting, that Mary had outgrown her sister, and that both were remarkably good-looking. First, let me show you your room, and then you can settle comfortably to tea. We are not to wait for Mamma. She thought you would not mind sleeping together, as our house is so small, and I have done my best to arrange things to your taste, for I know of old you have only one taste between you. Look, my room is next yours, so we can help each other very cosily. Only pray don't think of unpacking now. There will be plenty of time this evening, and he must be famished. Come. But Agnes lingered still, eager to thank her cousin for the good-natured forethought which had robbed her own apartment of flower-vases and inkstands for the accommodation of her guests. The calls of Mary's appetite were, however, imperious, and very soon the sisters were snugly settled on a sofa by the fire, while Maud, in a neighbouring armchair, made tea. "'How long it seems since my birthday party,' said Mary, as soon as the eatables had in some measure restored her social powers. "'Why, Maud, you are grown quite a woman, but you look more delicate than ever, and very thin. Do you still write verses?' Then, without waiting for a reply, "'Those which you gave Miss Savage for her album were very much admired, and Magdalen Ellis wished at the time for an autograph copy, only she had not the courage to trouble you. But perhaps you were not aware that poor Magdalen has done with albums and such like, at least for the present. She has entered on her novitiate in the Sisterhood of Mercy, established near our house. Why, poor, said Maud, I think she is very happy. Surely you would not like such a life, rejoined her cousin. They have not proper clothes on their beds, and never go out without a thick veil which must half blind them. All day long they are at prayers, or teaching children, or attending the sick, or making poor things or something. Is that to your taste? Maud half sighed, and then answered, You cannot imagine me either fit or inclined for such a life. Still I can perceive that those are very happy who are. When I was preparing for confirmation, Mr. Paulson offered me a district, but I did not like the trouble, and Mamma thought me too unwell for regularity. I have regretted it since, though, yet I don't fancy I ever could have talked to the poor people or done the slightest good. Yes, I continue to write now and then as the humour seizes me, and if Miss Ellis— Sister Magdalen, whispered Agnes— if Sister Magdalen will accept it, I will try and find her something admissible even within convent walls. But let us change the subject. On Thursday we are engaged to tea at Mrs. Strawdy's. There will be no sort of party, so we need not dress or take any trouble. Will my aunt go with us? asked Agnes. No, poor Mamma has been ailing for some time, and is by no means strong. So, as Mrs. Strawdy is an old schoolfellow of hers, and a most estimable person, she thinks herself justified in consigning you to my guardianship. On Saturday we must go shopping, as Aunt Letty says you are to get your winter things in London, and I can get mine at the same time. On Sunday, or does either of you dislike cathedral services? Agnes declared they were her delight, and Mary, who had never attended any, expressed great pleasure at the prospect of hearing what her sister preferred to all secular music. "'Very well,' continued Maud. "'We will go to St. Andrew's, then, and you shall be introduced to a perfect service, or at any rate to perhaps the nearest English approach to vocal perfection. But, you know, you are to be quite at home here, 
so we have not arranged any particular plans of amusement, but mean to treat you like ourselves. And now it is high time for you to retire. Here, Agnes, handing to her cousin a folded paper, the result of a rummage in her desk. Will you enclose this to Sister Magdalen, and assure her that my verses are honoured even in my own eyes by her acceptance? You can read them if you like, and Mary too, of course, only please not in my presence. They were as follows. Sweet, sweet sound of distant waters falling on a parched and thirsty plain. Sweet, sweet song of soaring skylark calling on the sun to shine again. Perfume of the rose, only the fresher for past fertilizing rain. Pearls amid the sea, a hidden treasure for some daring hand to gain. Better, dearer than all these is the earth beneath the trees. Of a much more priceless worth is the old brown common earth. Little snow-white lamb, piteously bleating for thy mother far away, saddest, sweetest nightingale retreating with thy sorrow from the day, weary fawn whom night has overtaken, from the herd gone quite astray, dove whose nest was rifled and forsaken in the budding month of May, roost upon the leafy trees, lie on earth and take your ease, death is better far than birth, you shall turn again to earth. Listen to the never-pausing murmur of the waves that fret the shore. See the ancient pine that stands the firmer for the storm-shock that it bore, and the moon her silver chalice filling with light from the great sun's store, and the stars which deck our temple's ceiling as the flowers deck its floor. Look and hearken while you may, for these things shall pass away. All these things shall fail and cease. Let us wait the end in peace. Let us wait the end in peace, for truly that shall cease which was before. Let us see our lamps are lighted, duly fed with oil, nor wanting more. Let us pray while yet the Lord will hear us, for the time is almost o'er. Yea, the end of all is very near us, yea, the judge is at the door. Let us pray now while we may, it will be too late to pray, when the quick and dead shall all rise, at the last trumpet call. 2. When Thursday arrived, Agnes and Mary were indisposed with colds, so Mrs. Foster insisted on her daughters making their excuses to Mrs. Strawdy. In a dismal frame of mind, Maud, assisted by her sympathizing cousins, performed her slight preliminary toilet. You have no notion of the utter dreariness of this kind of invitation. I counted on your helping me through the evening, and now you fail me. Thank you, Mary, I shall not waste eau de cologne on my handkerchief. Good night, both. Mind you go to bed early, and get up quite well to-morrow. Good night. The weather was foggy and raw as Maud stepped into the street, and proved anything but soothing to a temper already fretted. So, by the time that she had arrived at her destination, removed her walking things, saluted her hostess, and apologized for her cousins, her countenance had assumed an expression neither pleased nor pleasing. "'Let me present my nieces to you, my dear,' said Mrs. Strawdy, taking her young friend by the hand and leading her towards the fire. "'This is Miss Mowbray, or, as you must call her, Annie. That is Caroline, and that is Sophie. They have heard so much of you that any farther introduction is needless.' Here Maud bowed rather stiffly. But, as we are early people, you will excuse our commencing with tea, after which we shall have leisure for amusement. There was something so genuinely kind and simple in Mrs. Strawdy's manner that even Maud felt mollified, and resolved on doing her best not only towards suppressing all appearance of yawns, but also towards bearing her part in the conversation. My cousins will regret their indisposition more than ever, when they learn of how much pleasure it has deprived them, said she, civilly addressing Miss Mowbray. A polite smile, bend, and murmur formed the sole response, and once more a subject had to be started. "'Have you been very gay lately? I begin to acquire the reputation of an invalid, and so my privacy is respected.' Annie coloured, and looked excessively embarrassed. At last she answered, in a low, hesitating voice, 
we go out extremely little, partly because we never dance. Nor I either. It really is too fatiguing. Yet ballroom is no bad place for a mere spectator. Perhaps, though, you prefer the theatre. We never go to the play, rejoined Miss Mowbray, looking more and more uncomfortable. Maud ran on. Oh, I beg your pardon. You do not approve of such entertainments. I never go, but only for want of someone to take me. Then, addressing Mrs. Mowbray, I think you know my aunt, Mrs. Clifton. I visited her years ago with your mamma, was the answer, when you were quite a little child. I hope she continues in good health. Pray remember me to her and to Mr. Clifton when you write. With pleasure. She has a large family now, eight children. That is indeed a large family, rejoined Mrs. Strawdy, intent meanwhile on dissecting a cake with mathematical precision. You must try a piece. It is Sophie's own manufacture. Despairing of success in this quarter, Maud now directed her attention to Caroline, whose voice she had not heard once in the course of the evening. I hope you will favour us with some music after tea. In fact, I can take no denial. You look too blooming to plead a cold, and I feel certain you will not refuse to indulge my love for sweet sounds. Of your ability to do so, I have heard elsewhere. I shall be most happy. Only you must favour us in return. I will do my best, answered Maud, somewhat encouraged. But my own performances are very poor. Are you fond of German songs? They form my chief resource. Yes, I like them very much. Baffled in this quarter also, Miss Foster wanted courage to attack Sophie, whose countenance promised more cake than conversation. The meal seemed endless. She fidgeted under the table with her fingers, pushed about a stool on the noiselessly soft carpet until it came in contact with someone's foot, and at last fairly deprived Caroline of her third cup of coffee by opening the piano and claiming the fulfilment of her promise. The young lady complied with obliging readiness. She sang some simple airs, mostly religious, not indeed with much expression, but in a voice clear and warbling as a bird's. Maud felt consoled for all the contrarieties of the day, and was bargaining for one more song before taking Caroline's place at the instrument, when the door opened to admit Mrs. and Miss Savage, who, having only just reached town, and hearing from Mrs. Foster that her daughter was at the house of a mutual friend, resolved on begging the hospitality of Mrs. Strawdy and renewing their acquaintance. Poor Maud's misfortunes now came thick and fast. Seated between Miss Savage and Sophia Mowbray, she was attacked on either hand with questions concerning her verses. In the first place, did she continue to write? Yes. A flood of ecstatic compliments followed this admission. She was so young, so much admired, and poor thing looked so delicate. It was quite affecting to think of her lying awake at night meditating those sweet verses. I sleep like a top, Maud put in dryly which so delighted her friends, and would so charm the public if only Miss Foster could be induced to publish. At last the bystanders were called upon to intercede for a recitation. Maud coloured with displeasure. A hasty answer was rising to her lips, when the absurdity of her position flashed across her mind so forcibly that, almost unable to check a laugh in the midst of her annoyance, she put her handkerchief to her mouth. Miss Savage, impressed with the notion that her request was about to be complied with, raised her hand, imploring silence, and settled herself in a listening attitude. "'You will excuse me,' Maud at last said very coldly. "'I could not think of monopolising everyone's attention. Indeed, you are extremely good, but you must excuse me.' And here Mrs. Savage interposed, desiring her daughter not to tease Miss Foster, and Mrs. Strawdy seconded her friend's arguments by a hint that supper would make its appearance in a few minutes. Finally the maid announced that Miss Foster was fetched, and Maud, shortening her adieus and turning a deaf ear to Annie's suggestion that their acquaintance should not terminate with the first meeting, returned home dissatisfied with her circumstances, her friends, and herself. 3. It was Christmas Eve. All day long Maud and her cousins were hard at work putting up holly and mistletoe in wreaths, festoons, or bunches, 
wherever the arrangement of the rooms admitted of such embellishment. The picture frames were hidden behind foliage and bright berries. The bird cages were stuck as full of green as though it had been summer. A fine sprig of holly was set apart as a center bit for the pudding of next day. Scratched hands and injured gowns were disregarded. Hour after hour the noisy bustle raged, until Mrs. Foster, hunted from place to place by her young relatives, heard with inward satisfaction that the decorations were completed. After tea Mary set the backgammon board in array and challenged her aunt to their customary evening game. Maud, complaining of a headache, and promising either to wrap herself in a warm shawl or to go to bed, went to her room. And Agnes, listening to the rattle of the dice, at last came to the conclusion that her presence was not needed downstairs, and resolved to visit the upper regions. Thinking that her cousin was lying down tired and might have fallen asleep, she forbore knocking, but opened the door softly and peeped in. Maud was seated at a table, surrounded by the old chaos of stationery. Before her lay the locking manuscript book, into which she had just copied something. That day she had appeared more than usually animated, and now, supporting her forehead upon her hand, her eyes cast down till the long lashes nearly rested upon her cheeks, she looked pale, languid, almost in pain. She did not move, but let her visitor come close to her without speaking. Agnes thought she was crying. "'Dear Maud, you have overtired yourself. Indeed, for all our sakes, you should be more careful.' Here Agnes passed her arm affectionately round her friend's neck. "'I hoped to find you fast asleep, and instead of this you have been writing in the cold. Still, I did not come to lecture, and am even ready to show my forgiving disposition by reading your new poem. May I?' Maud glanced quickly up at her cousin's kind face, and then answered, "'Yes, if you like.' And Agnes read as follows. "'Vanity of vanities,' the preacher saith, "'all things are vanity. The eye and ear cannot be filled with what they see and hear. Like early dew, or like the sudden breath of wind, or like the grass that withereth, is man, tossed to and fro by hope and fear.' So little joy hath he, so little cheer, Till all things end in the long dust of death. To-day is still the same as yesterday, To-morrow also even as one of them, And there is nothing new under the sun. Until the ancient race of time be run, The old thorn shall grow out of the old stem, And morning shall be cold, and twilight grey. This sonnet was followed by another, Written like a postscript. I listen to the holy antheming that riseth in thy walls continually. What while the organ peeleth solemnly, and white-robed men and boys stand up to sing, I ask my heart with a sad questioning. What lovest thou here? And my heart answers me. Within the shadows of this sanctuary, to watch and pray is a most blessed thing. To watch and pray, false heart? It is not so. Vanity enters with thee, and thy love soars not to heaven, but groveleth below. Vanity keepeth guard, lest good should reach thy hardness. Not the echoes from above can rule thy stubborn feelings or can teach. Was this composed after going to St. Andrews? No, I wrote it just now, but I was thinking of St. Andrews. It is horrible to feel such a hypocrite as I do. Oh, Maud, I only wish I were as sensible of my faults as you are of yours. But a hypocrite you are not. Don't you see that every line of these sonnets attests your sincerity? You will stay to communion tomorrow? asked Maud after a short silence, and without replying to her cousin's speech, even these few words seemed to cost her an effort. Of course I shall. Why, it is Christmas Day. At least I trust to do so. Mary and I have been thinking how nice it will be for us all to receive together. So I want you to promise that you will pray for us at the altar, as I shall for you. Will you? I shall not receive tomorrow, answered Maud, then hurrying on as if to prevent the other from remonstrating. No, at least I will not profane holy things. I will not add this to all the rest. I have gone over and over again, 
thinking I should come right in time, and I do not come right. I will go no more. Agnes turned quite pale. Stop, she said, interrupting her cousin. Stop, you cannot mean. You do not know what you are saying. You will go no more? Only think, if the struggle is so hard now, what it will be when you reject all help. I do not struggle. You are ill tonight, rejoined Agnes very gently. You are tired and overexcited. Take my advice, dear. Say your prayers and get to bed. But do not be very long. If there is anything you miss and will tell me of, I will say it in your stead. Don't think me unfeeling. I was once on the very point of acting as you propose. I was perfectly wretched, harassed and discouraged on all sides. But then it struck me, you won't be angry, that it was so ungrateful to follow my own fancies, instead of at least endeavouring to do God's will, and so foolish too. For if our safety is not in obedience, where is it? Maud shook her head. Your case is different. Whatever your faults may be, not that I perceive any. You are trying to correct them. Your own conscience tells you that. But I am not trying. No one will say that I cannot avoid putting myself forward and displaying my verses. Agnes, you must admit so much. Deep-rooted indeed was that vanity which made Maud take pleasure on such an occasion in proving the force of arguments directed against herself. Still Agnes would not yield, but resolutely did battle for the truth. If hitherto it has been so, let it be so no more. It is not too late. Besides, think for one moment what will be the end of this. We must all die. What if you keep to your resolution and do as you have said and receive the blessed sacrament no more? Her eyes filled with tears. Maud's answer came in a subdued tone. I do not mean never to communicate again. You remember Mr. Paulson told us last Sunday that sickness and suffering are sent for our correction. I suffer very much. Perhaps a time will come when these will have done their work on me also, when I shall be purified indeed and weaned from the world. Who knows? The lost have been found, the dead quickened. She paused as if in thought, then continued. You partake of the blessed sacrament in peace, Agnes, for you are good, and Mary, for she is harmless. But your conduct cannot serve to direct mine, because I am neither the one nor the other. Some day I may be fit again to approach the holy altar, but till then I will at least refrain from dishonouring it. Agnes felt almost indignant. Maud, how can you talk so? This is not reverence. You cannot mean that for the present you will indulge vanity and display, that you will court admiration and applause, that you will take your fill of pleasure until sickness, or it may be death, strips you of temptation and sin together. Forgive me, I am sure you never meant this. Yet what else does a deliberate resolution to put off doing right come to? And if you are determined at once to do your best, why deprive yourself of the appointed means of grace? Dear Maud, think better of it. And Agnes knelt beside her cousin and laid her head against her bosom. But still Maud, with a sort of desperate willfulness, kept saying, It is of no use. I cannot go tomorrow. It is of no use. She hid her face, leaning upon the table and weeping bitterly, while Agnes, almost discouraged, quitted the room. Maud, once more alone, sat for some time just as her cousin left her. Gradually the thick, low sobs became more rare. She was beginning to feel sleepy. At last she roused herself with an effort and commenced undressing. Then it struck her that her prayers had still to be said. The idea of beginning them frightened her, yet she could not settle to sleep without saying something. Strange prayers they must have been, offered with a divided heart and a reproachful conscience. Still they were said at length, and Maud lay down harassed, wretched, remorseful, everything but penitent. She was nearly asleep, nearly unconscious of her troubles, when the first strokes of midnight sounded. Immediately a party of Christmas waits and carolers burst forth with their glad music. The first part was sung in full chorus. 
Thank God, thank God, we do believe, thank God that this is Christmas Eve. Even as we kneel upon this day, even so the ancient legends say, nearly two thousand years ago the stalled ox knelt, and even so the ass knelt full of praise, which they could not repress while we can pray. Thank God, thank God, for Christ was born, ages ago as on this morn, in the snow season undefiled, Christ came to earth a little child. He put his ancient glory by, to live for us, and then to die. Then half the voices sang the following stanza. How shall we thank God? How shall we thank him and praise him worthily? What will he have who loved us thus? What presents will he take from us? Will he take gold or precious heap of gems? Or shall we rather steep the air with incense or bring myrrh, what man will be our messenger to go to him and ask his will, which having learned we will fulfil, though he choose all we most prefer, what man will be our messenger? This was answered by the other half. Thank God, thank God, the man is found, sure-footed, knowing well the ground. He knows the road, for this the way he travelled once as on this day. He is our messenger, beside he is our door and path and guide, he also is our offering, he is the gift, that we must bring. Finally all the singers joined in the conclusion. Let us kneel down with one accord, and render thanks unto the Lord, for unto us a child is born, upon this happy Christmas morn. For unto us a son is given, first born of God, and heir of heaven. As the echoes died away, Maud fell asleep. End of part two.